<laughs> I know it's, uh, it's the right time to go and drink a little bit, but uh, we're maybe an hour and a half away from that, so hopefully you'll give me a little bit of your patience and listen to another lecture on quantum computing. I'll, I'll continue from where I started last time, uh, which I claimed was the only, the only mystery in quantum computation. Okay, we like the title. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic topic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so basically I said if you have a photon, and this is a very simplistic picture in the sense that no one can really deterministically generate a single photon. You can't press a button and a photon comes out. Lots of people would like to do that, but you can't quite do that yet. If you're worried about that, you can do down conversion, which some of you here know, know about. Generate an entangled pair, detect one of them, and then you have. Um, another photon, and at least you know that you have another photon from a process like that. So what I said is if you have some kind of interferometer, and that's what I drew last time, so you've got this um, uh, beam splitter, and I talked about a 50-50 beam splitter, I said for some of these things you may want to, you may want to hedge the, gauge the bets differently if you, if you don't want to uh, exploit certain dangerous devices. Um, and what I said is, this photon, as far as we know, to the best of our understanding, and we don't have any other understanding of, of describing this, and the beam splitter really goes both ways. I said experimental, experimentally minded people may worry about me talking about things going both ways at the same time, because they may think, if I want to really confirm that, I need to put detectors in each of these arms and I'm never going to get two clicks, one in each detector. So that's almost disproving what I'm saying. But detection is just one possible physical operation. <coughs> there are many other operations that we could use to see whether the photon really exists in two different locations at the same time. What I talked about are, are pieces of glass through which a photon goes to get a certain phase. And I personally, don't see any difference between a quantum measurement with any detector uh, and a piece of glass of that type. So to me, a piece of glass is as good a proof of what's happening as anything else. Um, of course, in order to confirm that there is something interesting happening, you need to recombine these guys. So there was a mirror one and a mirror two. And then when you recombine them, these guys come to the same beam splitter here. And what I said is, is that classically you'd expect these guys to go both ways in some sense, half of the times they go left and half of the times they go right. But actually we never see one of these possibilities. Uh, the photon always goes this way. And you can calculate this very nicely. Um, and I said calculation really shows you the basic gates in quantum computation. So I'll just take you through that so that you see uh, a harder gate. That's one gate that you will see, and another one is a phase gate. And then we'll just have to upgrade it a little bit more, and once we have a control node, which we will have in a 10 minutes time, then, then you can basically um, do any quantum computation. So if you label, if you label, you can really label each of these parts as zeros and ones. All you need to know is that this part is distinguishable from that one. But if you want to be really completely pedantic, you know, then you should label them all with some numbers. So this would be like a state one, this would be state two, this would be state three, and whatever, four, five, and six, and seven. And you can really follow nicely the linearity of, of quantum mechanics here. This is a good exercise in, in path integration. If you're scared of finding path integrals, then actually in the simplest instance, this is what this all boils down to. It's just Lots of fancy word, words actually to describe something that's actually really simple. Um, so the first beam splitter, I claimed, sends a photon in the state one into an equal superposition of, of two and three. Again, if you really want to be completely pedantic, then you should include the phase of this guy. So when, when light recoils of a medium like that, and there's a 45 degrees recoil here. There's a phase that the photon gains. And the phase is basically e to the i times the angle. In this case, the angle is pi by 2. And again, for those of you who are a bit more mathematically minded, there's just the root of minus 1. 
So this guy here gets a root of minus 1. You don't have to include it. You could get rid of the, the face if you really like. And now 2. Two, you, you see, now I'm going to follow what 2 does. And independently, I'm going to follow what 3 does. And you can do every calculation like that because quantum mechanics is linear. And like I said, linearity is a hugely important property in this world. Lots of equations of physics are, are linear. For example, wave propagation um, in, uh, of pressure in the air is also a linear process, which is why when you go to see a band play, you can tell the lead singer from the guitar, and you can say, OK, here's the DJ Rito playing now, now is this guy, and so on, if you like this kind of stuff. So you can tell the drums from the guitar, from the piano, from the voice. If the, if the equations were not linear, then two different things would not come to you independently as they are, but they would somehow scrambled up in the, be scrambled up in the middle. And that would be very bad for human communication. I think you couldn't live at least the way we live now. So most of the equations of physics are like that. And now you can say, okay, what happens to 3? Three? 3 just gets recalled again from a, from a piece of glass. So there's another phase factor, i. Uh, so that's basically i squared um, for 2. And there is another i. Uh, uh, sorry, actually, I'm, I'm doing already. You can see that I'm becoming super lazy already. Um, what I want to say is that 2 goes into 4. I was going to continue to call it 2 because it's, in, it's really the same branch. But let's be super pedantic now. So 2 goes, goes into 4, but it gains an extra i phase. So this gets multiplied by i, and i squared is minus 1. Let's put it directly there. And 3 goes into 5, but there is this i, i phase shift between the two, between the two here. And now they encounter the same beam splitter at the very end. Okay, you see I follow both of the paths simultaneously. Um, and so 4 now goes into an equal superposition of 6 and 7. So this was, this was the first beam splitter. This was the, the mirror, uh, and or both mirrors times 2. And then we have the last beam splitter, if you like. And the last beam splitter says 4 goes into 6 plus i7. So there is a minus sign still from there. And 4 goes into 6. There is no phase shift. It just goes, I mean, there is a phase shift, OK? But it's equal for both of these, and you don't have to worry too much about it. 6 plus i7. And then this guy, 5, becomes, um, becomes basically 7 plus i6. So there is an i6 plus 7, OK? And now when you expand this, you will see the you will see the constructive and the destructive interference unless I made some serious mistake in my calculation. So now I just expanded at the output to see whether the photon is in 6 or in 7. Um, minus 6 here, and minus, this is i squared, minus 1, OK? So there's a factor minus 2, 6. Now this is minus i7 plus i7, 7 cancels out. There is no component of 7. So this is a proof, formal proof, using the basic rules of quantum mechanics that the photon is always going to come out this way. Uh, if you stop to think a little bit more intelligently, rather than just brainlessly calculating, which is an, a, an activity that I try to keep encouraging people to do, then you wouldn't have to do all this calculation if you understood that quantum mechanics is completely symmetric under time reversal. So there is no way that the photon could have come out this way. So if I flip this board upside down, I'm going to get exactly the same picture. That's what I'm saying. And if anything else happened here, I wouldn't get the same picture. So I didn't even need to calculate, but I just want to show you how nice and simple this is. Now, factor of 2 is just there because I was simply super lazy to normalize it at each step. The first beam splitter really goes into a superposition of 1 over root 2, an equal superposition. And there's another beam splitter which has another root 2. So basically, there's 1 over root 2 squared, which is the half which cancels this 1. The minus 1 sign is an overall phase. And in quantum mechanics, we cannot measure overall phases. We can only measure relative phases. So the probability is 100% to end up in 6. Nothing ends up in 7. 
why they do this calculation if you could see it immediately? Because now I want to play the game that I played yesterday just to summarize the whole thing. If I now disturb one of these paths, so how do I know that the photon really exists in the path 4 and the path 3 at the same time? Because if I put some kind of piece of glass here that delays the photon, and the thickness of the glass is exactly such that the product of the wave number times the thickness, this is your k dot x if you like, is exactly equal to pi, then the phase shift that the photon is going to gain at the output is a minus sign here. So that means number four, whichever way it enters in my normal calculation, now enters with an extra minus sign here. So this minus one will be the plus one. And you can follow the logic through. This minus sign is the plus sign. And if I do that, then the sixes cancel out. They act uh, negatively, if you like. They cancel each other out. And the sevens um, enhance each other. And then this is a, a, a way of seeing that, that the photon always comes out in this direction. So if I put a, a minus phase here, the photon comes out this way. If I put a minus phase here, but not here, the same happens. So this is this Deutsch's algorithm, how to determine which of the two possibilities I have without calculating all four possibilities, uh, one after another. And, and, and so it's interesting. So basically, if you introduce one phase shift here, again, I remind you that the arm of this interferometer could be 10 light years in some sense. That's how big it could be. So I've got something that's really separated, and I claim that the photon exists in both of these because if I put something here, it's going to interact with it. And simultaneously, if I put something here, it's also going to interact with it. How do I know that? Because when I combine it, these two will be taken into account. Okay? So I don't want to be too dogmatic about the interpretation of quantum mechanics, but I think if you don't see the quantum computers and the many worlds in this, you probably haven't got a soul in some sense, as Feynman would say. It really is very suggestive. Okay, it's very good. Okay, now I want to start to I want to start to generalize this a little bit so that we can do another algorithm. Slightly more interesting and I think this is the one that's gonna ultimately be the most ubiquitous one that quantum computers will do. So far we haven't got anything as interesting as that in terms of generality. Um, so now, um, if you say, okay, this is all nice and nice and simple, I'm using one photon, which is equivalent to one qubit here. Notice that in practice, um, experimental physicists would actually try to exploit other degrees of freedom as well. This is a waste of a photon in many ways, because a photon is a complex entity, actually. It's also got polarization, for example. I'm not talking about polarization there. I could be talking about that, and it could be another qubit then. So then I have one photon, the location is one qubit, uh, left or right, and the internal degree of freedom is another qubit. So I could actually start playing some entangling games with this kind of stuff, if I could exploit. And then you could upgrade your beam splitters to polarization dependent beam splitters and do some, some things like that. So, so what can you do when you, when you do stuff like that? The general, the general statement, so what, what we've done so far is really a gate that sends zero into zero plus one, so you know, if 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 I call this guy, if I call this guy zero and this guy one, because all you need for this calculation is two different states. I don't need to label them all the way up to seven. Then the Hadamard gate just um, just sends zero into zero plus one and one into zero minus one. Hadamard is a, is a French guy, actually French mathematician, who lived a long time ago, who for some reason. So all these, why mathematicians do things they do, I have no idea. You know, I keep confessing this to you, so I can't explain the mind of a mathematician to you. But 150 years down the line, somehow this guy suddenly is useful to us in physics. I think I'm being very unfair probably to Hadamard. He's a, he's a great mathematician. But basically, all that we extrapolated from his very productive career <laughs> is a Hadamard transformation. And this is the one here. Okay, it's a single bit. Um, rotation, if you like. And it's for us very important because it tells us that we have the ability to create a superposition. And once we can do that, things quantum mechanically kick off simultaneously. So you don't have to worry 
about whether what I do to zero is going to be the same as what I do to one, because by default, that's quantum mechanics for you. The other gate that we, that we said was really crucial is that sometimes you'd be encoded, it seems that it's better to encode the information into a phase of your system. That's going to be a really important lesson, and I think we'll be, we'll be using that next week quite a lot. So if I send a state x into my gate, uh, x could be either 0 or 1 in this case. This uh, phase gate, if you like, I don't know how to label it. Let's call it a unitary transformation with a subscript uh, pi. What comes out is, is basically either plus or minus 1, depending on whether x was uh, 0 or 1. And I labeled it yesterday very conveniently e to the i pi f of x, x. You see, this gate doesn't make sense classically. Because classically, x, if x stays x, that really means you're not doing anything. This extra phase doesn't have a meaning in classical physics. I have to be careful, actually, with what I'm saying. Because you can say, what are you exactly calling classical physics now? And I think quite a few people have asked me this question before, and it, and it is debated all the time. Let me just digress for a, for, for a few minutes just to, just to say uh, something on this issue as well. If you consider Maxwell's equations, and the electromagnetic theory, a classical theory, in the sense that there is no quantum superposition there. You didn't put hats on the E and the B field to quantize them and whatever other voodoo things we have to do to get things quantized. Uh, then, basically, you can also claim that this phase comes out from the Maxwell's equations. I don't need to quantize them. I, would be I can describe this classically. I can shoot a laser pulse with lots of photons, which would be the classical um, uh, equivalent in some sense, and then I can describe the exact same interferometer with classical electrodynamics. And you can then say, wait a second, you're doing Deutsch's algorithm with classical pulse. How come? The only way I can potentially uh, possibly answer that is that there is always some kind of inefficiency when you do something like that, in a sense. If you call using 10 to the power of 20 photons per second an efficient protocol, and so B, then it's efficient. But we're talking about a single qubit here that you have to, you have to model. Once we generalize this to n qubits, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this issue um, in the next half, then when, when you want to see how it scales with, with n qubits, you will see that classical physics, no matter whether it's Newtonian or electromagnetic or whatever else, scales always very badly. There is some, something that always blows up in the resource. But a computer scientist would not think about it because computer scientists don't know about electrodynamics. So when they talk, talk about classical physics, they only have Boolean logic in mind. Uh, and this is what fails uh, in this case. So you have to be careful how you compare the resources. It's just one thing to keep in mind. Now, this is not enough to do any computation because what you have to be able... So this only allows you to, to, to create a superposition between, between two states of a qubit and this says I can control the phase between 0 and 1. But of course, if you have lots of qubits, and we said this would be the analog of the Boolean circuit model of, uh, of uh, classical computers. If you have lots of qubits entering, then what you have to be able to do is create superpositions across all of these qubits. And you cannot do that unless you somehow have the ability to interact between at least two qubits. So you have to have at least a gate that couples two qubits at a time. And maybe then you can do another two qubits. And maybe in between, you're using some of these single qubit gates and so on. And that's a typical circuit model for a quantum computer. But you have to have something that can create an entangled state if you put inside something that's not entangled. And I'll talk a little bit about this gate because it's very important. And some of the things we said before about teleportation and making bell measurements, I think, are going to become more or less obvious now when, when I show you how this works. So it turns out, so in the same way that, that George Bohr was after universality, he said, what kind of operations does human brain need to be able to do in order to be able to capture any calculation possible? And, and he figured out that things like an AND gate and an OR gate and a NOT gate constitute a nice basis 
from which you can get any arithmetic operation, for example, or anything else, any uh, 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 functional calculation. Now, the analog in quantum, in quantum computation is really a set of gates like this, plus, plus one of those control gates, if you like. You can squeeze it all into a single control gate, provided that you rotate by a non-trivial angle in some sense, but let, let's not worry too much about it. So the famous, probably the most famous coupling gate uh, in computing, not in physics, that's not what you would do in physics. It's a very, it's a very unusual one for physicists because we never have anything like that really given to us naturally. But a C naught is something you encounter all the time in computing. And C naught, I think by now everyone knows, uh, knows what happens, is that you've got two qubits. And, and the first one is usually called the one that, uh, that, uh, that, that basically uh, is, the, is the control qubit. This guy controls what happens, um, what happens to the second, uh, second qubit. Already from this picture you can see that, you can see that, that physics uh, ain't going to give you something like this usually. Because it's an asymmetric gate. When you put two physical systems close to each other, usually the interaction is very symmetric. So what happens is some kind of equal exchange of information. So what you're going to get actually for free in nature is a swap gate. You're never really going to get a control knot. If you take a square root of a swap gate, you'll get a control knot effectively. But this control knot does not for free come, come out there in the real world. So this, this, nothing happens when both of them are zero. And nothing happens when both of them are zero, one state. Because you only do things if the first qubit is in the state one. And what you do is you flip the value of the second bit. That's why it's called a control knot. You do a knot on the second qubit, but only if the first qubit is in a state is in a state um, one. And otherwise, you do nothing. So basically, this goes into one one, and uh, one one goes into one zero. You can see that it's a unitary transformation. Orthogonal states go into orthogonal states, so there is no problem with doing something like this. The exciting thing, of course, is when you couple a Hadamard guy with this kind of gate. Okay. So what I want to talk about is a little bit about uh, what is the quantum computation to execute that measurement. Um, so the first part, in the first part of the course, I was just basically using the, the Hilbert space formulation. And I was saying, now you've got two qubits. Make a measurement in this basis, and you get an outcome. And then if you say to me, how do I do that? Then I would say, well, there are orthogonal states. And uh, postulate number three of quantum mechanics says that any orthogonal states can be perfectly discriminated. But I was hiding behind a bunch of mathematical axioms that doesn't tell you anything about how to really do it. And in fact, this will tell you a little bit more, uh, surprising though it may seem to you given that this is computer science. But I think this, uh, this, uh, this model will tell you actually what's going on. Let's run it in reverse. Let me start from a, from a disentangled state of two qubits, 0, 0. Again, all I'm doing now, although it may not be that easy to see, is running an interferometer like that twice. I'm going to send in one photon, and I'm going to have another interferometer with another photon, and I'll be doing stuff with that. And then when I put these two guys together, I'll be getting things like that. The only problem with photons, OK? is that it's very difficult to get them to interact with one another. Okay? So if I have a green laser and a blue laser and I shine them through each other, you never get what you see on, in Star Wars movies. Okay? You can't fight with these guys. They go through each other. They don't see each other at all. They're so boring. I mean, that, that's the problem with that. You need some kind of nonlinearity. And nonlinearity involves probabilistic things and that usually kills you, although there are very good proposals to do even that. But it gets much more fancy. So if you now did one of those Hadamards here, and you do a control knot, and if you follow the dynamic, needless to say, a typical exam question for you guys is, is to be able to count. I know you like this kind of stuff. Uh, it's, 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 it's very good, actually, to just make sure you can do simple things that I can do here. And if I can do it, you can do it. And I'm not going to ask you anything harder than that. So that, that's the logical way. Um, OK, so what happens here? Hadamard flips this guy into a state 0 plus 1. So after the first Hadamard gate, you're entering. So the state here, if you like, is basically that state. 
and then you do a control knot, but zero, zero, so again, it's all nice and coherent to the point that zero, zero doesn't do anything, but one, zero flips to one, one. Um, and here is an entangled state. I'm starting from a product state, and I'm getting an entangled state, okay? Now, this is more or less the best you can do in some sense if you want to clone. I proved to you initially that you cannot clone in quantum mechanics. But that doesn't mean you cannot copy in each individual world if you permit me to use the many worlds language. So basically, what I'm really doing with the control knot is I'm copying zero into zero, which means I'm really doing nothing. And I'm copying one into one. So in this world, I really created a copy of zero. In this world, I created a copy of one. Of course, this is not the same by now, everyone knows, this is not the same as 0 plus 1 into 0 plus 1, which would be genuine cloning, but this is the best you can do. It. And in this case, you're creating a maximally entangled state, which is, which is a nice thing to have. And now you can play the game. What if I put another pair of qubits inside in a different state? What if I put the state 0, 1 here? Let's just go to, through a few of these just for you to see what's going on. So basically, if I put input 0, 1, and I do a Hadamard, this guy now, I know it's impossible to take notes when I lecture because I keep rewriting on top of what I've already written. I mean, I know that lots of students have written hate mails to me because of this, but I mean, that's the way I am, I'm sorry. And I'm not going to apologize for that too much. Okay, now, um, what, what does this do? Well, 1, 1 goes into 1, 0. So look what I'm creating now. The first guy stays 0, 1, because this guy is 0. But the second one, guy, guy doesn't stay in 1, 1. It goes to 1, 0. You can see the truth table over there. That's another entangled, maximally entangled state. So if I, st if I have this guy, 0, 0 ends up going into 0, 0 plus 1, 1. But 0, 1 ends up going into 0, 1 plus 1, 0. What about 1, 0? Well, 1, 0, remember, if I start with 1 up here, then, then 1, when I, when I do a Hadamard, so this is what I'm doing now. Even I'm getting confused with what I'm doing. So if I start with 1 up there, then this becomes 0 minus 1 superposition. Then I do a control knot. Again, nothing happens to 0, 1. This guy, again, goes into, into this guy, but with a minus sign in between. So 1, 0 goes into 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So you see, I'm getting all the bell states like that. And 1, 1, needless to say, has got to be the one that hasn't appeared so far, because these are orthogonals. I mean, this, this is a unitary transformation. I've got to send an orthogonal basis into another such basis. But now I've got a fully entangled basis. And now you ask me, how do we do a bell state measurement? Alice has a qubit that she receives what we discussed as an unknown qubit, whatever this means. And she's got half of the pair from this is this entangled pair that, uh, that they use for teleportation. Here is Alice's qubit, one that she needs to teleport, and the other one that comes from half of the entangled pair. How does she do a Bell state measurement? She inverts, it, she inverts what, what's written up there. That's again the beauty of quantum mechanics. Now if you put this upside down again, if you run the computation this way, <coughs> then basically what you're doing is you're converting maximally entangled states into product states. Okay? So, so if she does, here is the network, okay? If she does a control knot and the Hadamard, and then measures in the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 basis, she just puts detectors and sees where, where she gets the clicks, if you like, in, in very simple language. Then she knows what the bell projection did there. So if she gets zero, zero outcome, if she says, I've got a photon here and a photon here, in some sense, this would really correspond to horizontal, horizontal in the traditional implementation of that. Then she says, ah, what I really measured is this guy. So I pick up the phone, I communicate with Bob, and I say, hello, Bob, the outcome now is 5 plus. Bob knows what to do. See, now it's really nice and simple. This guy tells you how to rotate from a maximally entangled state to a non-maximally entangled state. And you can actually phrase 
any measurement like that, if I give you a measurement in any basis and you look at it and you say, how on earth am I going to do something like that? You can always construct a nice unitary transformation based on these gates that's going to do the inversion for you. Okay, if you understand this, I think you understand more or less it. Uh, let me see how much I have to torture you for before the break. I think five to ten minutes, okay? So I want to start the, the, main, the main topic of, of, uh, of the second part. What I, what I, I, I have these photons in mind all the time, by the way. But, but basically, the, the, beauty, the beauty of the, of the gates and qubits and, and abstract thinking is that now you can think of any other representation of a qubit and it's going to run in exactly the same way. All you need to do is ask yourself, do I know how to implement a control lock? Do I know how to implement a Hadamard? Yes, I do. Great. I've got all the components now. I can compute this. And it's always the same logic. Uh, so that's, that's, like I said, that's how I became a solid state physicist in one afternoon. Because I already understood qubits and gates, and then someone told me, here is a Georgeson junction, that's a qubit, here is changing the flux, that's your gate. And I said, great, man, now I can apply for solid state jobs as well. So this is a way how we expand our physical knowledge. <laughs> it's not impossible, actually, because of this unity of physics, that one day you end up knowing everything there is to know in physics. That's really beautiful if you can do that. Because it's like that, it's all very similar. Um, to make this point a little bit more concrete, think of a two-level atom. Just want to show you the analog of an interferometer to show you that it's one and the same story. Here is a ground state in which the electron can exist, and here is the excited state. And they are going to be our zeros and ones. Typically, you would shine some kind of laser on this atom. And if you shine, if you know the intensity of this laser, we'll talk about it next week, how exactly to do these things. And like I promised, I'll talk to you about it in three different implementations. They're going to be so different that I hope to capture anything, basically, that matters in quantum computation. Now, you say, if I shine this for long enough, if I look at my watch and I measure the system, after some time, I will get this guy to flip uh, to the excited state 100%. If I stop my... Uh, experiment halfway through, then of course what you did really is created an equal, I don't know how to draw it, of course, we all know that there is no local hidden variable, so if I could draw it, I would be valid in quantum mechanics. So basically, what I'm saying is that what people call a pi pulse or pi by two pulse would actually create g plus e for you after some time. This is called a Ramsey interferometer, a guy called Ramsey, but it's exactly the same as the other interferometer, mathematically speaking. All of them are the same, and each new interferometer leads to a Nobel Prize. How good is that? Huh? We can generate infinitely many Nobel Prizes. Now, this guy, you can think of as going through free space. This is enough to gain a phase difference between excited and ground. So all I need now is something to discriminate and to kick in a minus sign in front of E and nothing in front of G. But you know that if you leave them on their own, these, are, these guys are going to oscillate at their own frequency. Suppose that the ground state energy is zero, just to make our calculation simple. And suppose that this energy here is h bar omega. Okay? Now, what this means is that during this free passage, this guy is going to evolve into g plus e to the i omega t, plus or minus here depends on how you like to label these guys. Um, and that's going to be now a superposition, but it could be a very different superposition. If you follow Deutsch's algorithm, this guy, for example, omega t could be pi. Imagine you time it exactly for this, this amount of time. Then this sign becomes basically a minus one. So you could create g minus e out of g plus e. That would really correspond to the interferometer I showed uh, earlier. Okay. And then you have again the same atom going through another Ramsey zone with some kind of classical laser. I'm saying classical because there are no classical systems in this universe. It's all quantum. But apparently classical interacts. And this guy does exactly the opposite of what this guy did. So you do exactly the same transformation for the same amount of time. It's a self-inverse transformation. It gets you back to either excited state or ground state. And then you measure your system, and you ask, is it excited? Is it ground? And that tells you 
about which kind of phase difference you had here. Okay? That's how you would do it with atoms. Do the same with NMR and anything else. So once you know how to estimate the phase, then you know how to compute anything because everything in quantum computing is kicked into a phase of the system. That's something that a classical computer cannot do. So this whole thing can be presented in the language we used before. Alice present, prepares some state e to the i phi 1 and she sends that to Bob and says to Bob, estimate phi. Tell me what is the phi that I prepared. And of course, Bob, who is very well acquainted with quantum mechanics, says, forget about it. You've sent me one quantum state. There's no way I can do that. It's a single shot thing. I can't do that. There are infinitely many possibilities. She says, OK, then. I'll prepare another qubit like that, and I'll send it to you. OK? There's another qubit in the same state, and so on. And after a certain number of qubits like that, you can actually come up with a nice unitary transformation a slightly more detailed quantum computation, which is going to give you <coughs> the digits of phi for the output. Every quantum computer looks like that. Okay? That's the only mistake. Phase estimation. All functions are kicked into the phase, and then the output has to be able to tell what the phase is. We'll see factorization as an instance of that. What I want to what I want to what I want to do now actually is just just mention what I what I will talk about in the next uh, in the next uh, forty minutes. Um, the problem that I think is going to matter most in the long run is the search problem. And I said that I think this is going to matter most simply because most difficult problems, if we don't know how to solve them, and that means that they're difficult, uh, reduce themselves to some kind of brute force searching. Okay. Like I said, I think Marcelo reminded me very beautifully of, 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 of the most important, possible, possibly for him, the second most important problem in life, which is how to find a partner, basically. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, you've got a list of things, basically, that your partner should satisfy. You know, he's uh, good looking, he's got a uh, good sense of humor, he can cook, whatever else you like, uh, you like to have there. And then you approach the first person and you're checking, you know, is he funny? No. Let's go to the next person and so on. And given that there are, given that there are six billion people, well, okay, three billion may be a variable depending on which way you swing in some sense, <laughs> then basically um, there is quite a lot of uh, elements to search for. And of course, this is a very difficult task. And anything like any, any complicated problem ultimately really just go, uh, reduces itself to searching over all alternatives and then finding the one that, that you want. And what I want to show in the next lecture is how to do this quantum mechanical. I'll just capture it for you classically first. You're given a black box again which computes the function f and I'll tell you what the function is. This function has the following. This is, this is how you would capture a search. Okay? This is the same, like I said, as, as the standard oracle in, in, in Greece, you know, that we're all fascinated by. So basically, Keanu Reeves goes to the oracle and says, am I the one? And the oracle says, no way are you the one. Okay? She doesn't tell him, oh, I know who is the one. It's John Smith around the corner who is the one. That would be really too powerful. But the oracle has the intuition to tell whether this guy is the one or not. So what does the oracle do? You put in, you put in zero. One, two, three, so you put in some x, and f of x comes out. Now the search is constructed exactly in this way, that only Keanu Reeves gives you the one out, and everyone else doesn't, because he's the one. I mean, in the movie there was this subtle twist, and of course there was a not gate applied by the oracle in between, in some sense, just to trick the guy. Anyhow, this function has the properties that it's equal to one if x is equal to some element i, Okay? But it's actually equal to zero in all other instances, for all x that's not equal to i. So imagine you've got one million elements in your database, and someone gives you, so one million numbers, one million x's to search over, and someone gives you the oracle and says, find which element is detected by the oracle. How would you solve that? Do whatever you like. It's always bad. You always have to go more or less through the whole 
uh, through the whole database. So either searching it randomly and putting in random access or start starting systematically and saying, I'm going to put in 0 and I get f of 0. I look at it, it's equal to 0. It's not the 1. I put in 1 and so on. And at some stage, you can see that the worst case scenario is if the end element is the 1. So you're searching over the whole database and you have to get all n minus 1 elements to be equal to 0 before you can tell that the end element is the 1. It's very bad. It scales as the size of the database. And what I'm going to try to convince you next, uh, in the next half, is that quantum mechanics can really significantly improve that. Let's take a 10 minute break. So I realized that I mentioned one thing, but I didn't, didn't really show you that. So let me use that as an aside, and I think you asked the question nicely to remind me that. I said that the natural uh, control knot basically is not really a control knot, uh, yeah, and, and it's more like an exchange interaction. Um, I think I wrote it down formally, formally in terms of uh, in terms of uh, um, power spin matrices. So typically in solid state, you've got some kind of interaction like that, which really is an exchange interaction in the sense that it swaps uh, the states of two qubits. So if they come in as, as uh, up, down, this interaction is going to create down, up. Okay, so 0, 1 goes into 1, 0 in some sense. And that's what occurs for free in nature. It occurs for free because of the power exclusion principle that I mentioned before briefly, that if you have two electrons and you try to put them very close, this is the origin of any, anything in the theory of magnetism. If you try to put them too close to each other, then the spatial wave functions overlap to a high degree, which means they're in a symmetric state. But because the whole thing is, uh, is, is two fermions, they have to be anti-symmetrized, which means internally they have to be in, a, in an anti-symmetric state. And this operator, is an effective Hamiltonian, so that's not really what happens, whatever happens there, I have no idea myself. But this guy actually <coughs> describes the anti-symmetrization in spin, in spin systems. And that's actually what you get, what you get for free. Um, so swapping things is, is kind of easy to do in nature. Nature does swaps for free all the time. You don't have to ask nature, please do a swap. It just happens continuously. Uh, how would I write a swap in terms of control knots? Um, so I have a state psi, most general, and I have a state phi. Um, you know, imagine this is something like a0 plus b1, and this is c0 plus d1. Another nice example question. Um, if you apply three times a control knot here, you will actually get these guys to swap. It's very interesting. So if I do a control knot like that, so this is now the control bit and this is the target bit. And I do another one the other way around. And then I do a third one this way. Then what's going to come out of this network is the state phi. So the state phi, phi will end up upstairs, if you like, and the state side will end up downstairs. So this is a unitary transformation. Uh, and it's comprised of three control knots. But in nature, this is given as one box. It's given as, as, as this kind of guide for you. Um, and, and now you can see roughly what you have to do to get a control knot. Like I said, if you think of this as a natural interaction, a unit of stuff that you get for free in nature, all you have to do is stop it halfway through then you're effectively doing a control knot. I mean, you're doing a control knot and a half. So you have to rotate it a little bit, and then it ends up being a control knot. But the square root of swap, swap is this guy, the box. This square root of swap is actually as powerful, in the sense of being able to entangle things, <coughs> as, as the swap. You see, the swap doesn't entangle. You really want them as a product state at the output. But if you stop, at the midpoint, then they wouldn't have swapped fully. And at this point, you would get some kind of state. Now I'm being really loose. You probably wouldn't get this state, but let's write it down anyway. An equal superposition of these guys. There are probably some phases missing and whatever else is missing. 
So the, the swap is natural, but control mode can somehow be distilled. I'm talking about really things like solid state implementations. If you really are able to cool your, your atoms down to the ground state, as they do in, in ion trapping or Bose condensation, then you're not worried about it. You can do a control knot. Control knot is as easy in some sense as a swap. You can just do it deterministically. But, but for more complicated systems, you, you don't have this luxury to, to proceed in this way. Anyway, once you have this kind of gate, and, and you can do some kind of local transformations, in addition, you have a universal set of gates. Any unitary transformation in n qubits can be decomposed into these kinds. Um, so back to Grover. The problem that we started with was, was a function whose only one item, only one value is one, and the rest of them are zero. So this is like a database database uh, of certain elements, like a, like a library of books, which in some sense, that's why people like to call it an unsorted database. Because when you enter a library, then someone has already invested a huge amount of work to create the library. Someone has raised lots of money from his daddy, had to collect a huge army of people, had to get all of the Greece up in arms, to start to colonize the Middle East, enter North Africa there, and set up a city called Alexandria. And then he says to one of his guys, go and make the library. And I want the best library that you've ever seen in the world. And now this guy spends 20 years of making a sorted library. That's an easy one to search. That's the whole point of a library. I'm deliberately going through this story because you will see that there is an issue with quantum mechanical libraries. This is something that people point out every time we tell them about this. I don't think it's an issue. And I will tell you why not, but it seems like an issue. So basically, the library in this case is not sorted. If it's sorted, you know exactly where to go to find a particular book. But in unsorted one, you have to look at every title. Is, it, is this War and Peace? No. Is it War and Peace? Yes. I would also throw it away myself, by the way, but in this case, anyhow. Unsorted library. Now, how would you, what would you do quantum mechanically? Well, what you would do is exactly what I explained before, is that you would kick the value of the function into the face of the, of the input. You wouldn't really keep it, you wouldn't really keep it uh, in the amplitude, so to speak. So imagine now a quantized oracle uh, in the sense uh, that um, any of these database elements enter, and what comes out is e to the i pi f of x. So this is a minus sign. In other words, if you write this truth table for, uh, for, for a quantum system, this is a minus sign only when x equals i, uh, and it's plus sign for all the other elements, if you like. Uh, and of course, when you look at it only in this basis, then Again, you, you will say, how can you now gain any efficiency? I mean, are you really doing anything different to before? And the whole point is that what I'm going to do now is input a superposition of all possible elements. And that's where the key is going is to be for quantum computers. So rather than just inputting the x, I'm going to input all possible database elements simultaneously. So 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on. Okay. And now, the the oracle, the box, the F box, this guy, which is now a unitary transformation in a, in a way, U sub F. This box is going to produce a coherent superposition with a minus sign in exactly the place where you like it. Okay? So, you know, there will be 0 plus 1 plus 2 and so on, and then there will be this guy I, which gains the minus sign, and the rest of them will just be the same up to N. I should really call it n minus 1 because I claim that n data is element of n minus 1. Um, and now the question is it's all nice and coherent. The oracle told me, in some sense, the oracle told me which is the right element. But again, you say, that's very nice, but how do I measure this minus 1? How do I extract that information? And, 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 and the oracle is sneaky enough, of course, that it doesn't really tell you how to do that. So, for example, if you were to make a measurement, in the computational basis, you would only get one of these elements out now. And they're all equally likely. There is one over root n uh, uh, amplitude for each of these guys, which means one over n 
probability for each of them to take place and basically um, it's very unlikely that you will hit the right guy. So this is not a way to do it. It's not enough that you just kick in one, one minus sign. You have to do this uh, more, more frequently anyways. Um, and I will show you actually what you need to do, the sequence of transformations that you need to do to get this guy uh, to work. Um, I want to go back to the issue of, um, of, 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 the, of the superpositions of database elements. So when you call this a database, and when you say, I'm going to show you an algorithm where quantum computing is much better than classical, and then you start this problem, you say, now you input the superposition of database elements. Then someone looks at you and says, how are you going to superpose one million books in a library? And you, you're guessing that I think even that can be done. And one day it will be done with enough money. Uh, but what you would really do is you would actually get it already created for you on a quantum disk. So this is the work equivalent to what Alexander the Great had to do to found the first library, serious library in the world. So basically, this only works once it's already encoded in a quantum mechanical way. So it's unfair for me to compare quantum search in, in this way that I first have to create a database and then I'm searching it, that's really difficult. Of course, that experiment would be very difficult to do. But that would really be then the analog of counting the time from Alexander's birth up until the, the final uh, creation of the library. So you don't count it like that. You're given the library, you're given the quantum disk, and now you shove it into this box and you search it. And that's actually a very simple thing to do. So I think this still genuinely is faster than the corresponding class. This, this is the, the fair comparison. So now, how would you, how would you do this quantum mechanic? You know, what's, the, what's, the, what's the trick here? And the trick is that, that there, there are basically two or three different ways of, of understanding this. And I'll try to present all three of these guys in some sense just to give you, just to give you different pictures and hopefully uh, you will see at least that one of them makes sense to you, and I think that's good enough. Uh, the way that it was originally um, discovered was by, by Grover, who, uh, who works for, for the Bell Labs, just like Shannon. Actually, Bell Labs is an amazing institution. I think it's got more Nobel Prizes than any other institution. Uh, very powerful, academically speaking, actually. And, uh, and you can see that they would care about computation. So, of course, research like this uh, is traditionally funded. So what Grover said is the following. He said, he said, imagine if I could do the following. And then he showed that you can do the following. He said, imagine. So initially, I've got all of these states which have an equal amplitude. So imagine now, here, here's the line representing the database elements, whatever, 0, you know, 1, 2, and so on. Okay? And now imagine. <coughs> So this, this guy here is going to be the amplitude. So they all equal, they, they start from an equal state of all of these amplitudes being equal to 1 over root n, which just means I have no idea what I'm really doing. And I'm putting this. That's the best input I can put, since all of them are equally likely to be the right answer. So basically, here is the first time. All of them go up to 1 over root n. Here is the first amplitude, and the second, and the third, and so on. So this is like a histogram, if you like, of amplitudes, OK? Now, Grover says, I'm able to put a minus sign in the right database element, which means I flip the sign of the amplitude. So if upwards is positive, then downwards is negative. And here is this i element whose, uh, whose amplitude I'm going to invert. This is the state corresponding to what I wrote down after the first application of the oracle. The question is going to be, how many times do I have to query the oracle? Am I the one? Am I the one? Am I the one? And at some stage, the oracle says, OK, give me a break. You are the one. OK, that's the quantum mechanical version of that. So, so basically, what Grover says is, imagine if I could do the following. Imagine if I could flip all of the amplitudes about the average value of the amplitude. So, if this guy is pointing up, the average value is the value of each amplitude itself, because all of them have the same value, so the average has got to be that value. But when I flip one of them, the average becomes a little bit smaller. Of course, if n is very large, this one 
only can be seen a little bit. So basically, your average now is somewhere here in the next step, slightly reduced by the fact that one of them has a negative sign and contributes negatively when you add them all up. Now you say, imagine I could reflect about the average. Actually, Grover just argued that you should be able to do this unitarily. He was a computer scientist. He could not be bothered to even show you how to do that. But it's just clear that you should be able to do it. So what's going to happen when I flip this about the average is that this guy gets reflected here, this guy gets reflected here, and so on. All of them are the same, other than the negative guy, which, when it gets reflected about the average, gets reflected over here. This is called amplitude amplification. It's a very general method, actually. It's not just Grover's search. Everything works in this way. So when I show you how powerful Grover's search is, it's actually how powerful a quantum computer is in general, if you want to ask the more general task. So now you say, aha, uh -huh, now my average has gone down even more. So why don't I flip this guy into the minus again? So I do the Oracle query again. Who's the, who's the one? And the oracle query is now going to going to make this negative, but of the same large size. And what this means is that my average is now even lower. And you can get the picture of what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be flipping about the average and putting the minus sign. Flip about the average, put the minus sign. And then at some stage, if I'm smart enough to stop at the right time, and if I don't ask any more questions, all of these guys would have gone down to zero and the right guy would be amplified to 1. And then I make a measurement. And then, of course, I have to get the right guy. That's the only answer I can get. Okay? You can do this deterministically. Um, so that, that, was, that, was Grover's, uh, that was Grover's idea. Amplitude, amplitude amplification. What happens if I keep querying the guy? I don't know when to stop. And I say, OK, I'm going to keep querying the guy. This is, this is a unitary transformation, okay? You've got to have Newtonian dynamics, and there is something that's known as the Poincaré recurrence. There was a French guy called Poincaré, who was a mathematician, who said basically, um, who said basically that if you, if you have some kind of transformation of a reversible type, some kind of uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, then basically your initial configuration, if you give the system enough time, will be revisited with a certain frequency infinitely many times, providing you allow an infinite amount of time. This was something that killed one of Boltzmann's arguments of reversibility. Okay? So if you start from a bunch of atoms of gas in one corner of the room, and if you wait for long enough, they will end up in the same corner. Of course, the time may be infinite uh, for, uh, when you compare it to the age of the universe. It could be very large, but you can show mathematically that this is bound to happen. The same in quantum mechanics. If I keep doing, let's call Rabi flopping in the two-level system. If I keep doing the same thing to the system, it's going to be coming back to the same state over and over again, uh, like a flop. The same here. So if you keep insisting on asking the question, then these guys are going to start to grow, and this guy is going to start to shrink, and you will come back to the original state. Okay. So someone compared this uh, quantum mechanical way of computing to a very unusual way of cooking. When you're cooking something, you put ingredients together, you shove it into the oven, and you wait for one hour. Okay? And then you take it out, you, you taste it, you say it's great. It's, a, it's perfect timing. What happens if you miss the timing? It's one and a half hours. Don't do anything. Just let it evolve for another half an hour. And after two hours, it's going to come back to exactly the same state. Okay? So this periodically gets cooked properly. And if you wait for long enough and if you know the periodicity, you can always do that. So this is, this is nice and, 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 and unitary as always. Now, I don't know how, how convincing this picture is for you. So in some sense, let me show you, let me show you another way. This is going to be another important lesson, actually, that, that we keep emphasizing. There is one way, which I think is very beautiful, to me it's very insightful, of seeing the difference between quantum and classical physics. Um, in classical physics, probabilities really look like balloons. You know, they look like volumes. You put a phase space, and you've got one balloon sitting there telling you that one system is within this line, and you've got another one telling you that another system is there, and so on. So you've got, you've got one volume, 
with some probability for system A, and then you've got another volume and another volume, and they add up as, as volumes. So all of these probabilities really geometrically correspond to volumes. In quantum mechanics, volumes are near, not really the fundamental entities. In quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics geometrically resembles ordinary, geo, uh, or ordinary uh, Pythagorean, if you like, geometry. So basically what quantum mechanics says is you shouldn't be representing them as, as, as balloons. You should be representing them as triangles like that. And then you've got a size A, and you've got a size B. And to get the answer here, you're going to be taking something like the sum of the squares of this guy on the square root. That's the right geometry for quantum mechanics. Not the balloons, but this kind of ancient Greek geometry. Okay? Because amplitude squares the probability. It's obvious why I'm doing what I'm doing. Once you know that, here is a, a really nice way of viewing Grover's search algorithm. From each of these, in fact, you can infer how quick the algorithm is. But I'm not going to show it to you formally, because I want to show it to you in the most exciting possible way. And I'm afraid for that you have to wait for Monday. Okay? So I want to keep you waiting over the weekend and saying, I've really got to attend this guy's lecture on Monday, because he's going to show me the most exciting thing in the quantum well, computation. I was going to say the world, but it's not quite like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Two-dimensional geometry. Imagine I've got, I've got a starting state of my computer, which is an equal superposition of all database elements. Uh, I think probably better to use uh, many colors now, but we, we can maybe get by with, with lines like that. Here is the state, psi, which is equal to 0, plus 1, plus 2, and so on, plus n. For this one, it may be easier to prove, actually, the, 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 the speed up of, of Grover's uh, search algorithm, because you're, you're really talking about two-dimensional geometry, and that's all that you need to describe quantum mechanics. This state here will be the right element. This is why I only need two-dimensional geometry, because it's either the one or it's not the one, and this is one bit value. I don't need to draw in three dimensions, and that's very fortunate for me because I don't know how to do that. So basically, this guy is not the one. And I love this notation. It's orthogonal to the one, OK? So if you're not the one, you're orthogonal to the one. OK, that's for matrix four or five, whichever uh, movie. OK, so now what happens? What are these operations there? What do they correspond to in this, in, this, in this picture? The first operation I'm doing so now you'll see why I need a few more colors, actually. The first operation I'm doing is putting a minus sign in front of the I component. What's the I component? This here is the amplitude of the I component. And putting a minus sign in front of them just means reflecting this around I perpendicular. Okay? So basically, basically what this vector is going to do it's just undergo a flip around, around this point. So the next state, after I put a minus sign, is exactly symmetric with respect to this state. This is the first step of the algorithm, if you like, putting the minus sign. Now I have to invert about the average value of that. But inverting about the average value is nothing but flipping around the perpendicular value of psi. Okay? So the operation you need for that, and now it's really going to get very complicated. Let me use blue color again. I have to draw a perpendicular to this. And this I call psi orthogonal. And now my state has to flip around this guy. You can see that I drew it in a really nice way that I'm already done with my algorithm after this step. But this is not uh, what happens in, in, in real world, because this this angle is too big in some sense. This is much closer here. It's very small. Over. So basically what I do now is I flip this guy around this guy. And after repeating this a number of times, so basically I do this, I flip around this, I do this and flip around, you can show that after a certain number of steps, my guy, my input state, will end up aligned with the I vector. In, in, in my picture, it happens instantaneously, because if I flip this guy, around here, I'm almost there. In 
the negative direction, but minus i doesn't, the, the, the minus phase makes no difference. I cannot make a measurement and I say that's the one. But it's not going to work as nicely as that because in practice, like I said, you'll be starting from here and then you'll end up here and then you have to do it a certain number of times. And it's all to do with, with being able to uh, reflect around this vector and around this vector. It's all in two-dimensional geometry. And if you calculate what happens, how much of an angle do I gain by flipping twice, okay, what you will see is that after, uh, after one step, your angle changes by something like pi divided by 2 root n. So the change in the angle of your state, how much has the state moved with respect to initial state, is roughly pi by 2. I, I hope I got the factors right. Never mind, it's something divided by root n. Again, for a physicist, pi by 2 is 1. So this is 1 by <laughs> root n. How many times do I have to repeat it to get pi by 2 angle? So the, the evolution I have to make is from here all the way to here. So I have to basically cover pi by 2. But in every unit query of the oracle, I can do 1 over root 10 of that. So the number of steps is equal to root n. Now this is very nice. Instead of having n searches, which is the classical analog, I actually have only root n searches. Okay? So for example, if your database has one million elements, classically you would have to look at roughly one million elements before you found the one. Quantum, you only have to do one thousand. It's a huge difference for a physicist. For a computer scientist, so the reason why people keep talking about Shor's algorithm and other algorithms, and not maybe so much about this guy, he said, this is not an exponential speed up. This is only polynomial. It's only a square root n. But again, million and 1,000, they are very different to, and, and of course, this is very exciting for us to be able to do. But ultimately, it doesn't help you reduce very, very difficult problems to the, to the, to the easy ones. OK, now um, let me represent it as a circuit finally. And once I do it as a circuit, you will get the picture of how to do this with real qubits. And I think that's more or less the last thing I want to do. Um, okay. First of all, you have to create a superposition of all the database elements. And that's very nice and easy in quantum computation. It's always done with a harder. That's why this Hadamard guy is very important. Once you can create one superposition, you can do it all in some sense. All you need to do is flip each of the bits into the state of 0 plus 1. This is something that scales very nicely. It scales with the number of bits. It's not an exponentially difficult thing. It looks like something difficult uh, when you see the output, but it's actually not. So if you flip each of these bits into a state like that, and if you expand 0, 0, 0, you know, 0, 0, 1, and so on, you've actually got a superposition of all numbers x, where x goes from 0 to something like 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of qubits. So I've got a huge database there with 2 to the power, n is the number of bits. The capital n, if you like, in this case, is this 2 to the power of n. So this is just equal to n. That's the size of the database. But, but I've only made small n gates and I've already created all 2 to the n database elements. That's why I think this is going to be very easy to do in practice, to encode it on a quantum disk. This is not a problem. I really think this is not a problem with this. Right. OK, now what do I do? I need to be able to put a minus sign in front of this guy, the right guy. And then I need to flip about the average. So let me present this as a network with two qubits, because it's going to be very difficult to draw with all of these n guys. But if I do it with two qubits, you will see already what the what the, what the way to do this is really. So first of all, if they start in a state 0, 0, let's imagine they start in the ground state. Here is these Hadamards which create this state. What I have to do now is apply this oracle. So this is the guy that puts a minus sign in front of the right element. Okay? You already know that if you're using protons, you can do that with a piece of glass. 
easy peasy, it's a piece of cake. This is not a problem either. This is very simple, picking in a minus sign. Now what you do is you invert about the average. And what this is, is a Hadamard Hadamard gate, another unitary transformation, but now instead of putting the phase in front of the i element, you're putting the phase in front of the zero element. You identify one of these guys, usually your input state, the easy one. So this transformation, u0, uh, sends 0, 0 into minus 0, 0 and doesn't touch anything else. It's another unitary transformation, if you like. And you've got Hadamard's, and now you keep doing this. And how many times do you have to keep doing this? If you had, if you had, if you had capital N database elements, you would have to do this roughly square root n times. But if you have two only, which is what I'm going to show you through a very simple calculation, again, an ideal exam question. If you do that with two qubits, then you will get the answer in one shot. And so it's, it's slightly better than square root of four. Um, but this is an accident because it's, uh, it's really low dimensions. Okay, so how does this work? Can I, can I actually implement that and show you how this works? Um, so you start with something like element 0, 0. And I have the two Hadamard gates. You can see already that this resembles an interferometer. First, create a superposition. Okay? This is like the beam splitter. Then, phase kick. Then, another beam splitter. Every quantum computation looks like an interferometer. That's what I was saying before. It always looks like that. I've got to create a superposition. I've got to do something interesting. And I've got to undo the superposition in order to be able to measure in the computational basis. It's always like that. So now, what this does, and you're used to it already, this creates 0 plus 1 and 0 plus 1 state. Now I'm going to decide what's the element that I, that, that's going to be the one that's different. So imagine someone gave me a database where all the elements are, are, are the same, so they are not the one, if you like. So this guy goes into itself, this guy goes into itself. Let's choose one of them that's non-trivial in some sense. And then one one also goes into itself. So here is my database. Here's my oracle. Here's my quantum base containing the library of all the quantum books that you can imagine. And the one that you're looking for is the book called One Zero. So is this guy actually going to uh, going to do the job for you? Let me just expand this now. Now I'm just using algebra. I'm not using any computation. So this is zero one one zero and 1, 1. It's very similar to the interferometer we had before. So what kicks in now is what I call u sub f, the oracle. This guy puts a minus sign in front of the right element. That's this guy here. So I've got 0, 0, plus 0, 1, minus 1, 0, and plus 1, 1. Just a minus sign there. Now I'm going to apply another bunch of Hadamards the two Hadamards that I have here. I have to be able to do another five pulse in, in the quantum optics language. And, and so, so now, of course, I mean, you know, we're going to stay until tomorrow morning if I follow every, every step uh, properly. So the best way of doing this thing is really to factor things out nicely. And for example, say, let's factor out zero here, then I've got zero plus one. And let's factor out 1 here, and then I've got 0 minus 1. So just for a moment, if you imagine that this is 0, 0 plus 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1. Why am I doing that? Because I know that the Hadamard sends 0 plus 1 into 0. So Hadamard is a, is a reversible transformation doing that, right? 0 minus 1. So this guy becomes 0, this guy becomes, becomes 1. But I've also got to do the Hadamard on the first guy. So after two Hadamards, and unless I do something very stupid, but there is 30 of you following this very closely, and one of you is going to jump up and tell me when I make a minus sign mistake, which I keep doing. Um, if you do now the Hadamard on this guy, really, so this guy becomes 0, this guy becomes 1, this guy becomes 0 plus 1 into 0 minus this guy becomes 0 minus 1 into 1. Here is my state right here, right at this point of the computation. I've got to do two more gates, and then we have beer. Okay? That's as, as, as quick as it's going to get. So basically, 
What I do now is I kick in a minus sign in front of the zero, zero element. So if I expand this again, just to show you, what I have is zero, zero, plus one, zero, minus zero, one, plus one, one. All that happened is that this guy gave the minus sign as opposed to this guy, which was the previous minus sign. Okay? Now I put in a minus sign, so this is what I called u0. 